Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, and we're going to read a very familiar scripture here, but I want you to think about this in terms of what God is saying to us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Isn't this interesting? That God is telling us that this is what we have. How many of you are born again? If you're watching at home, raise your hands. If you're driving, just nod your head. Okay. If you're born again, then you already have this inside of you. This is not something that you need to ask for. It's something that you have. It's not something you need to get. It's something you need to let go that's already in you. You have the fruit of the Spirit within you. And that is love. So quit calling me and asking me to pray that you'll have love for your brother-in-law. You already have prayer answered there. You have the love for your brother-in-law. It's not a matter of you getting the love. It's a matter of you letting the love out. And there's barriers built up in our lives that keeps these things that we already have from flowing. Joy. Do you have joy? Well, yes, you do. Nehemiah 8.10 says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So sometimes if you feel a little weak, you just need a little joy. And where do you get it? You've got it. Have you been listening? You already have the joy. It's not a matter of getting it. It's a matter of deciding you're actually going to let it flow. You can be happy. You can be joyful. In Acts 26, 2, Paul said this, I think myself happy. (laughs) Well, you can think yourself happy or you can think yourself depressed. And you can either spiral down or you can spiral up, but the choice is yours because you have the joy. Quit asking God for joy. I wish I just had a little more joy, Lord. Lord, just give me a little joy in my life. And he's saying, you've already got it. Use it. Peace. Jesus said, I come to give you peace. Not like the world gives. The world has the kind of peace that you get because you got your bills paid. The kids are all making straight A's in college. And their college bill is paid. You can get a little bit of peace from that. But Jesus comes to give you a peace not like that. He comes to give you a peace beyond any peace that the world has to give. Look, when you become a Christian, the king of peace lives inside of you. And the scripture says, he himself, in Ephesians, it tells us, he himself is our peace. So we have peace. Are you all rattled about something? Well, I know this sounds harsh, but quit it. Just make a decision you're not going to be rattled. Make a decision that you're going to believe the Word of God when it says, none of these things affect me. I may be in the world, but I'm not of the world. I have a peace that the world doesn't have. Everything may be going to Hades all around me, but not me. I'm okay. Now the world will look at you and think you're just a lunatic. They're going to think you're weird. And you are. But that's okay. Let's be weird in the Lord. I mean, the Bible says that the world looks at us and they see see us and they think it's foolishness. Foolishness to believe. Foolishness to believe in life after death. 
Foolishness for us to believe in heaven. Foolishness for us to believe that all things work together for good to those that love God. They say, that's crazy. No. You're crazy. I'm normal in the Lord. I've got the Spirit of God living inside of me. Wow. Loretta, I'm inspired. <laughs> wow. Long-suffering. Now, that doesn't mean suffering for a long time. That means patience. Look, you can have patience. And patience will get you places faster than just being all strung out. Wednesday morning, I got up in Washington, D.C. Leisurely got packed at the hotel. And at 10 o'clock, I got in my car. That's correct. This is the first time in 17 years I've, I've gone to Washington, D.C. and I've gone every year. It's the first time I've ever driven. I've always flown in the past. And how many of you know that flying is just not the same now as it used to be? I mean, Mary Helen, she had a flight to D.C. and it got changed. So she went from Springfield to Dallas to Kansas City to Atlanta to Chicago to D.C. I drove and I got there first. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But I got up at 10 o'clock. Loretta and I went out, had, got us a cup of coffee at the hotel, got in the car. I put it on cruise control. I drove the speed limit. One time, one time I looked down and I was going 71. But I corrected myself, and I asked for forgiveness. <laughs> but you know what? That night, I was home all the way from Washington, D.C. in one day. You think, how can that be? You must have really pushed it. No, I drove the speed limit all the way. Every place it said 45, I went 45. Oh, I had people honking their horns, flashing their lights. I discovered... On, on the freeway at 70 miles an hour, you set it at 70, you go 70, everybody passes you. And they wave at you in that special way that they wave. But you've got to have patience. See, patience, patience is cool. Because you know that you know. You know, I, I kind of believe this. I believe that angels protect me the entire way. I believe when I break the law, they jump off the hood. Kindness. We have kindness, don't we? And this one thing I like about this church. I've been to a lot of churches in my life. This is the kindest church. The kindest group of people. You're kind of like one of a kind. You're, you're very kind people. When I do good, you compliment me. When I don't do good, you don't lie to me. You just say it's nice weather out. But you're very kind, you know, and I, I've noticed how people treat each other. We're all different. You know, we're different nationalities, we're different ages, we're, we're different genders. There's only two, by the way. You know, <laughs> there's only two. <laughs> See, in God's kingdom, there's just two. He created male and female. In the image of God, he created them. That's what the scripture says. He didn't create a herd. Okay, moving right along. <laughs> Kindness, goodness. See, goodness is something that uh, people do things out of the goodness of their heart. You can be kind, and then you can be good. You know, the, the, the deacons in our church. That's one thing I love about the deacons. They secretly, behind the scenes, they take care of the widows in the church. We have quite a few widows in the church. And uh, every now and then I find out something that they did they didn't even tell me about. They just, they just do it. You know, somebody, somebody needs tires or somebody needs a yard mode. Or they just do these things. That's goodness. And, and what's good is they don't stand up here in a row every week on the platform and brag about what they did. I mean, it's, it's goodness with humility. So, uh, wow, 
Praise the Lord. And gentleness and self-control. You know, gentleness is kind of nice. You know, you, you don't want people to see you as abrasive. You don't want people to see you as the person at the office that if they're going to talk to you, they got to wait for the right time. Because if they catch you at the wrong time, ah, no, 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 no. Listen, listen, are they in a good mood today? Can we talk to them today? Don't be that person. Be the person that people can talk to at any time. You may not want to listen all the time. I mean, once you become the person that everybody knows they can talk to, everybody will want to talk to you. And you'll have to pick and choose who you talk to, but be kind, be good. And you know the last part of this scripture that we have, we have these things. See, you don't have to pray to God that you will be more kind. Oh God, just make me a kinder person. I've heard that prayed. Just make me more of a, a good person. No, no, he already has. Your spirit man has been born again. Your spirit man's perfect. You are a good person. You may not act like a good person, but you are a good person. But we choose how we act. We choose how we respond. You blow up and have a fit of anger, don't be blaming the other person. Don't be blaming God. Don't even be blaming the devil. The devil's sitting back. You're doing a good enough job on your own. He doesn't need to help you. You know, no, if, if you're having a fit of anger, it's because you chose to. You can choose not to. You know, there's other ways of dealing with a problem other than yelling and screaming and throwing a fit. There's other ways. And trust me, the other ways are more effective. And the, the other ways are more godly. You say, well, I just got a temper. That's right, you have a temper. But the Spirit of God inside of you doesn't. You say, well, I know God got angry. Okay, God can get angry at things, but he gets angry at sin. And you're not to judge other people's sin. Thank you for your enthusiasm on that. <laughs> but see, this is the fruit of the Spirit that's inside of you. Now, I was listening to the radio the other day, and I heard something on the news uh, it was kind of a, a commentary talking about some of the problems we're having in, in the United States of America. And I know we have a lot of people watching from other countries. But in the United States of America, and probably in other places too, we have a problem with a lot of the young people getting into crime in the inner cities. Uh, and a lot of people getting into, a lot of the young people getting into things that they shouldn't be getting into. And what caught my ear was the fact that the uh, announcer said, our nation right now, for the first time in history, we are a fatherless nation. And he started talking about how there's so many families that don't have a father. And this doesn't mean that women cannot raise a child because women can raise a child trust me but there's something about a father in a home that is missing in our culture right now and i got to thinking about this what is missing well with with the men some of the times it's just that they run off they don't like responsibility they're gone they're out of here you know you're pregnant i'm gone i don't need another kid Okay, that's, that's the case sometimes. But sometimes a family can be fatherless when the father's actually living right there in the family. And I got to thinking about this. What is it that we could do in our country so that the men would walk? Yeah, the women are supposed to do this too. Okay, but, the, but that the men would walk in the fruit of the Spirit that we just talked about. That the men would walk in love, joy, peace, patience, that men would have kindness, goodness, that they would be faithful, that they would be gentle, and that they would have self-control and not just fly off the handle every time something doesn't go right and stomp out and get, get in the Corvette or the motorcycle or the airplane or wherever it is that you've got and just go out and just get away. You know, what is it that can make a, a, a man stay in the home 
and deal with things in the family the way God wants him to. And then we wouldn't be raising children that feel fatherless. See, what, what is it that makes a father? It's, it's not just being a man or being a male. It's not just somebody that procreates children. You know, Edwin Lewis Cole, great man of God, who's in heaven right now, he said that the characteristics of a true father was, was four areas. And he said, I wrote this down in a seminar once that I went to with him. He said, love, intimacy, discipline, and value. These are, these are four things that men of God need to walk in in order to be a father in their home. See, and we don't think of these things sometimes the way God thinks of them. For example, with love, see, you need to understand, fathers, you need to understand that your kids are watching you. You can say whatever you want to say, but they're going to watch what you do. And you are an example to them of how you treat other people and how you talk about other people and how you deal with other people because they see you discussing it in the home and then they see what you do, and sometimes what you discuss doesn't line up with what you do. See, you, you have to be honest with your love. You can't say you love someone. You know, Jesus said it to his disciples one time. He said, why do you say you love me, but then you don't do what I ask you to do? Hmm. See, instead of being dominated as men by our lust and our desires. We, we, we've got to quit living. Men, we've got to quit living and doing things to benefit ourselves at the expense of other people. Because when you do, your family sees it. And whether you want to admit it or not, you are probably the one that your kids look to the most as an example of how you treat the world and how you love. And then discipline. Wow. Do we discipline our children? You don't abuse your children, but there needs to be some type of discipline. And we have, we've gotten to the point in our country where we babysit our children with television programs that 25 years ago we wouldn't allow in our house. And, and we give them tools that have free access to pornography and abuse and cursing and all that type of thing, and we just freely give it to them and say, go sit over there, just Take care of yourself. In other words, what we're doing is we have quit taking the responsibility for raising our children. And we've taken that responsibility and we've given it to an electronic device. See, we make decisions on a daily basis and we make commitments but even without our own self-discipline, we'll never reach our goals if we don't have self-discipline. And that's the thing in the family. Your family knows. Men, I know it's not Father's Day. And this is not beat up on the Dad's Day. But this is a day where we're going to proclaim that men are men. Men have, have been afraid to call themselves men. Because... The world says you shouldn't do that. You're just one of 72 kinds. No, you're one of two kinds. And the one kind that you are is you're supposed to be, and I mean this in a loving way, you're supposed to be the head of your home. And if you can't be, then what? There's chaos. Hmm. Intimacy. 
That means listening. And that's an art that has just almost gone away. In conversations, most people in a conversation will say what they want to say and then quit and back off. No, as a parent, I think part of the problem is we don't listen to our kids. And you say, well, they're just talking about goofy stuff. That's fine. Sit down. Listen to the goofy stuff. You'll find out things. And there's ways to do it with wisdom. Now with Robbie, when Robbie was about eight years old, eight or nine, I had a way of working with him. I would bring him into his bedroom, set him on the edge of the bed, and I would walk in, and in a, in a very polite but stern way, I would say, Robbie, here's the deal. I know what you did. And I know where you hit him. It would go a whole lot easier on you if you would just tell me. Because if I have to tell you, you don't want that. Oh, Dad. And he would confess to all kinds of stuff I didn't even know about. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, he was telling. Of course, I didn't even know anything when I went in there. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he just started telling me all kinds of stuff. But see, you've you got to have that communication open. And there's ways to communicate without being abusive. All right? Okay. You've got to be a true man of God and a true father all the time. This is not just when you're at home. You, you need to be a good father to your kids when you're at work. Why are there so many gangs in America? You ever watch the news? There's a lot of gangs. Why are there gangs? It's because young people, they want to belong. Why are there so many cults? You say, well, there's not, not cults, not down here. Oh, yeah. I have family members that have been on Discovery ID in 48 hours and 60 minutes. There are cults down here. But why do people join these cults? Why do they do this? They want, to belong. they want love. And most of them have been missing it from their family as they grew up. See, this starts at a very early age. Now, you can't go back and change things that happened yesterday, but you can start today changing things, and then tomorrow you can say, yesterday I changed things. You know, Tomorrow, today, could be your yesterday that, okay, moving on. <sighs> but there is a feeling of fatherlessness in the world today. And if you don't have the right relationship in a family of having a father, it affects the children's ability to re relate to God the Father. You know, I had, had a situation a few years ago where I told this young person, I said, well, you know, now that you're a born-again believer, God's your father. And the response was, I sure hope he doesn't beat me like my old man did. See? The way you present fatherhood in your house is going to be the way your house perceives the fatherhood of God. And no man becomes a man just because you're a male. Boy. You know, fathering a child and bringing him into the world doesn't mean that you've got to rule over him with a fist. No, it means that you become an example to that young boy or that young girl, giving them direction to follow. You know, Ephesians 5.1 says that in the same way that children imitate their father, we should imitate God. And we always look at that verse from the aspect of, well, what God does, we need to do. But hidden away in that scripture is a truth that children will imitate their father. Not always, but 
Usually that's the case. Now, my PhD is not in counseling, although I did stay at a Holiday Inn once. But I did learn from a counseling course that I took, it took several months, that many, most, almost all of the sexual offenders who are in prison, when they researched it out, had been sexually abused as a child. And so this lets us know that the children will emulate something even if it's bad because that's what they're trained in. Today I was, uh, I told the worship team to be ready because I had thought one of my options was we, we were going to talk about the music of heaven today. And I was just going to have the worship team about every five minutes do a song. But we decided not to do that, didn't we, Lord? But one thing that I was going to mention is Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Well, the opposite of faith is fear. So you could almost say, because it's a spiritual force, that fear comes the same way. Fear comes by hearing. It just depends on what you hear. And when it comes to music, instrumental music can be given by God and is amazing. Handel's Messiah, I believe, that was given by God. But music with words penetrates your soul. That's why 20 minutes after you leave Walmart, you're driving down the highway and you hear, don't, 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 don't. Don't, don't, Louie, Louie, Louie. Yeah, you, see, you, you know, and you say, whoa, where'd that song come from? Well, they were playing it on the intercom at Walmart while you were shopping. See? And it, it, it kind of drifted down into your soul and your subconscious. And then when you're driving down the highway, not thinking about the speed limit, <laughs> you know, that song kind of pops into your head. What's that tell us? Music with words has the ability to uplift and inspire or to depress. You know, the last thing in the world you need if you're depressed is turn out all the lights, put a little lava lamp in the corner, put on B.B. King saying, you know, the thrill is gone. And I don't know why somebody on the front row on my ministry staff would know that song. <laughs> See, because when I said BB, you could have thought of a BB gun. You could have thought of Benjamin Netanyahu. Or you could have thought of the thrill is gone. Okay. <laughs> so when, when you listen to music, what do you listen to? I mean, it has words. It has words. And music with words will penetrate your soul and stay there, attach itself more than words without music. That's why we teach our children A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever the rest of it is. And, <laughs> but we, we teach them with music. You know, a father must stand behind his word. Broken promises to children. Broken promises to your spouse. Broken promises to the local business person. Let me tell you something. Uh, a few years ago, you, I've shared this once before, but I knew of a gentleman who he went and he bought a car at a car dealership, but he didn't signed the papers he just said I'll take it get it ready I'll be back in a few hours and so they started preparing this car and doing exactly what they said they would do in the contract they I think they told him well okay in the deal put on a new set of tires fix that crack in that windshield or whatever 
But they had some things to do, and it was going to take them several hours to do it. The guy said, I'm going to buy that car. I'm going to buy it. They shook hands, didn't sign the papers, and he left. Well, before he could go back to get that car, he found another car just like it for like two or $300 less. And so he went and bought the other car. And his, when he was telling me about it, he says, boy, I'm sure glad I didn't sign the papers. I am so glad I didn't sign the papers. And I said, but you gave your word. You shook hands with the man and gave your word. He said, yeah, but I didn't sign the papers. I said, so basically what you're telling me is I can't trust anything you say. Your word is totally worthless. I mean, sometimes you've got to stand with your word even to your own hurt. Go and pay the $300 more. What, what price do you put on your word? See, and your family sees that. I mean, I know this guy. And what, what, what's, his, what's his kids thinking? Well, dad saved $300. He had to lie to do it, but he saved $300. That trains them in the subconscious of their mind that they can go through life lying to get what they want. Is that what you want your kids to think? Because if, if you train them to lie to somebody else, they'll lie to you. When you promise your child something, you deposit your words into them. And if you, if you keep your promise, you redeem your words. But if you don't, your child will hold those unfulfilled promises. And they fo form layers of hurt and unfulfillment in their life. And eventually, additional words just mean nothing. You actually reach a point where your word just means nothing. They say, well, that's what they said, but I don't know what they're going to do. Don't be that person. If you give your word, do everything in your power to keep your word. And then stand behind God's word. If you want to be a, a man of God, you stand behind God's word. You want to be a father to your family, stand behind God's word. If you honor God's word, your children will honor God's word. You cannot allow your family to hear you as a parent, male or female. You cannot allow your family to hear you dishonor God's word, to go against God's word, to say things like, well, I know the Bible says we should do this, but let's just do this. No. You be a stickler for God's word. Hmm. God's creative power is in his word. When God speaks, it releases his spirit in his words. And his spirit can bring forth a manifestation of what his word says. If you can train yourself to get God's word in your mouth, then your mouth will create because it's not your word, it's your words containing God's word. See, little children respect what they hear. I'll never forget the little boy. I saw this. He was, uh, I don't know how old he was. You reach a point in life where you don't know the difference between a two-year-old and a six-year-old. That was supposed to be humor. But it's kind of true. He was a little kid, okay? And he was standing on a table. And his dad said, come here. And, and the dad was standing right up against the table. Jump. And the kid would jump, and the dad would catch him. He's just a little kid. And so the dad put him on the table. And I was, I was there. I saw this. And he said, jump. And the kid just kind of fell over, and the dad caught him. Dad's kind of looking at me, watch this. Puts the kid on the table, he backs up like this, and he says, jump. And the kid just, he didn't jump, he just fell over forward, and the father went up and got him. And he set the kid back up on the table, and the father started to walk away, and he got way back here, and the, kids, the kid just started to fall over. And somebody said something, and the father turned around, and he ran up, and he caught him. But here's the deal that I learned from that. Little children will put so much trust in you 
that even if they see you walking away, it doesn't matter. They know you're going to catch them. You know, that's what you call trust. I mean, pure trust. And while children are in the growing up area in your house, you need to develop the trust of God's Word in them. And then they will trust it no matter what things look like. Wow. Well, the rule of a parent in parenting. This is a rule. You got this? It's a rule. This is something we can make a poster out of. The number one rule in parenting comes from the Scriptures. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. That's what you should be able to say your kid, to your kids. I've heard fathers say, boy, I sure hope my boy didn't grow up like me. What are you saying? You know, what, what are you saying? No. Be the kind of man the Word says you should be, and then say, I sure hope my child grows up to be like me. Well, you may have not heard of a good earthly image of what a father is. But you were birthed into the kingdom of God and you became a son of God. Let me tell you something. You have the perfect image to follow. You have the perfect image to follow. Hmm. Just as the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of Christ, will fulfill a woman in her femininity and purposes, the same Spirit, when it comes into a man, will make him the man he should be. Let's take a look at that scripture in closing one more time. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And so parents, this is the way you're supposed to be in the home. And if the, the father will act on this scripture, then we will no longer have a fatherless nation. Ready? Let's all read this together. Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Father, in the name of Jesus, we commit to you today that we will do our part in bringing up our families in your word. That we will do our part in reversing this fatherless nation image that we have. That we will do our part in imitating you so that others can imitate us. In the name of Jesus, amen.